Today I want to talk about somebody named Voltrine Declare. Um, she's probably best remembered, if remembered at all, as an uh, individualist anarchist, feminist, um, an atheist. Uh, she had radical views at the time on marriage, the state, um, religion, um, and people's place, uh, people's roles as far as those institutions are concerned. Um, some people who are more familiar with her work, uh, who maybe have actually read Average's biography or um, The Exquisite Rebel and stuff like that, um, might be more familiar with her and maybe people like that wouldn't think it's so necessary to give her uh, a big presentation. But um, due to Average's biography actually being out of print, it's actually pretty tough to get. Um, it's, I, I, think it's, I think that she still doesn't get a lot of recognition in the anarchist movement. Um, and I think that she deserves a lot more. And due to Paul Average's biography being out of print, it's like a big blow to really understanding her because basically anybody who researches Voltaire is completely indebted to Average because he just uh, completely went um, secondary sources and, and even uh, first sources from, um, a lot of first source sources from um, back when Voltaire was actually alive and things she wrote and letters and stuff like that. Um, so, um, and another thing is a lot of the pieces that do talk about Voltaire tend to kind of color their, her with their own political views. Like there are certain reviews of Voltaire that color as an anarcho-communist. There are certain ones that do individualist. So I'm not saying I'm not going to do any coloring of my own, but I'm going to try to keep it to a minimum. Um, I'm trying to do this mostly as a biographical work and just a descriptive work. Um, I'm not trying to say this is the camp she fell into or um, whatever. Uh, I'm also... Um, not uh, here to point fingers about who has colored her and who hasn't in their own political views because I'm not too interested in that. But I am t interested in talking about her and her life and her political views. And I really do recommend the writings on Voltaire. Uh, the Voltaire Declare Reader, uh, which you can get from AK Press, uh, is really good. Um, you can get Exquisite Rebel, which is by Sharon Presley and Crispin Startwell, um, co-authored by both of them. And uh, Paul Average's biography is amazing. It's uh, uh, Voltaire Declare, an American anarchist, or something like that. And um, they're, they're all really great works, but I, I have my problems with all of them. But, I mean, overall, they're all excellent. And if you're interested in Voltaire, especially read uh, Average's work. Um, but, I, again, I don't have any of those with me, so I won't be able to show them off like I intended to. She did have a nickname called Voltai, which I might say sometimes. Um, and that's, uh, that was used by her close friends and family members. But it's just a short name for, um, for who, what her you know, full name was. Uh, and let's see. Oh, uh, there's a phenomenal collection of her anarchist writings, if you're interested in her, um, on the Libertarian Labyrinth wiki page. And that's run by Sean P. Wilbur. He does a lot of great uh, historical work. Uh, and I really recommend that. Um, you can really find a lot of her writings online. Not all of them, but um, I hope to transcribe a, a lot of them and put them online because um, I think they should be online. Um, so I'm going to skip around a lot, but I'm going to start with her early life and be a little bit biographical at first. I don't know how to change the whole box so it's easier to read or anything. But So Voltaire and Declare, originally D-E-C-L-A-I-R-E, or yeah, instead of D-E-C-L-E-Y-R-E, -E, uh, was born in Leslie, Michigan on the 17th of November, 1866. Her name was a product of um, basically uh, her father being a free thinker and a socialist, originally from, uh, born in France, and her mother being uh, a part of the abolitionist movement in America. Um, and she was basically the female version of Voltaire. Um, and so that was, that, that's kind of a cool thing to, to think about. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, her mother was Harriet Billings, originally uh, became Harriet DeClaire, and Hector DeClaire was her father. I won't be talking about them too much, but it's worth mentioning their names and all that. Um, but, yeah, because of her father's uh, free thinking and um, uh, her mother's radical thoughts on the issue of slavery, it's, it's no surprise, as her sister put it, that Voltaire was basically a genius. Um, so Voltaire's sisters were Marion, born in 1862, and Adelaide from here on out to be referred to as Addie for short, in 1864. Um, the former tragically died in 1867. Um, that led to um, them moving to St. John's in uh, Michigan. I won't be getting too much into all the nitty-gritty of the details because that would take up too much time. Um, but she was uh, put into a convent, which is basically a Catholic sort of school, when she was younger. Um, 
and but before I get to that, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead. Um, Voltarine was actually able to read at only the age of four, actually pretty well. Uh, and she was actually indignant at the primary school in St. John's for not letting her in uh, because she was underage at the time. Uh, but she was admitted next, uh, the next year and attended until she was 12. Uh, but her father eventually left because of struggling. Uh, it, was, it was hard to get a job at the time for him and also due to Marion's death, um, it led to a lot of pressure on the family and a lot of internal strife. Um, she eventually uh, saw him once Addie was really sick in 1879. He was a tailor by then. Um, but one of the main things in her early life was the convent. I really want to focus on that because that's really a big part of her early life. It's really important. Um, so it, it's kind of concerning why a free thinker would put their own daughter in a convent. You would think it would be the last place they would send them. Um, but it's not actually because her father was malicious or hated her or whatever. Um, there is a, an essay on her by Hippolyte Havel. I forget it. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but it's in her selected works. And he characterizes her father as pretty bad and, and not taking care of her well and having ill intentions. But what, what's actually more credible, and I, and I can see why anarchists would think this, um, but it's not actually true. It's, uh, he actually did this because he wanted to quote, and I'm actually quoting Hector himself, he wanted to refine her so she has manners and knows how to behave herself and cure her of laziness, the love of idleness, also love of trash, such as storybooks and paper. So clearly not a very nice reason, but he's not, he's not like a bad person. He just, you know, he doesn't like the way that she is and she, he thinks she'll be better off. And what, what more, what's more plausible is that he knew that the convent was the best school around and he knew that if he took her there, she would get the right kind of education. So it's, it's much more plausible he did it with actually good intentions. It's also worth adding that uh, her father basically went broke over the years as he let her attend this very pricey convent school. So if he was doing it out of malice, it wasn't a very smart form of malice because he basically went broke doing it. Um, so uh, I, I apologize about all the notes. I, I never changed that. Um, she took offense to it basically for the rest of her life, of course, uh, as she became a free thinker and um, she really didn't like the way that she was treated in the convent. Basically in the convent your mail is looked at, you're kept under a tight regiment, you know, you got the nuns with the rulers, you know, you gotta say more. Um, and her whole day was basically planned out in advance for her. Um, there was very little she could do that she couldn't, that there was li very little that she could do without supervision of the nuns. So only after three weeks of staying, this, uh, staying here uh, at the convent, Voltaire made the choice to run away. Now, she impressively not only got out of the house without her father being able to catch up to her, probably due in part because she left early in the morning, but uh, she, uh, after crossing the river to Port Huron, uh, Voltaire, without any money, walked 17 miles to St. John's, but however then she figured she couldn't make it, so she walked back. <laughs> Um, which is pretty impressive. I don't, she was very young, and I don't know how she did that. Um, but she went and walked back to Port Horon to ask for, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, at a relative's house. But instead of giving her food, they called her father. No, not called, but, you know, they sent for her father. And uh, he picked her up, and after that, she basically calmed down. She started really excelling in her studies. Uh, she remarked to her father that she had acted foolishly, and um, she was pretty meaning. Uh, she put a lot of meaning into it, so I think she was being sincere. Um, she grew, uh, she was excelling in her studies, particularly language and music. This would help her out for the rest of her life when she would give um, talks, or not talks, excuse me, she would give lessons on uh, how to play the piano and how to speak in different languages. Uh, this especially gave her connections to the Jewish anarchists um, who were in the Philadelphia, where, where she would live later in her life. Um, by 14, however, Voltaire basically disavowed um, the church. Um, she didn't believe in it. She didn't. The only thing she had left of her faith in Catholicism or Catholic religion was that she liked its ascetic sort of behavior, uh, dressing or being simple, not indulging in too many pleasures. Uh, she had this for the rest of her life, um, something I, I really respect about her. And she liked the themes of brotherhood and love as well as a care for the suffering. Oh, the Catholic church doesn't really do that very well, but um, she liked the ideal. Uh, even if it didn't live up to practice. Uh, but eventually Voltaire started rebelling, uh, and um, it was only begrudgingly that the convent basically gave her a gold medal, for, or it was a sort of award for being the top of her class. So she not only completely rebelled against the whole process, but came out looking very, very good. Um, but unfortunately, this didn't leave her a lot of practical skills. Um, but I'll get to that in a little bit. 
So, um, sum, summing this up, uh, Voltaire herself talked about this later when she was a free thinker. She said, quote, I struggled my way out at last and was a free thinker when I left the institution three years later, though I had never see, seen a book or heard a word to help me in my loneliness. It had been like the valley of the shadow of death. And there are white scars on my soul yet, where ignorance and superstition burnt me with hellfire in those stifling days. Am I blasphemous? It is their word, not mine. Besides, that battle of my young days, all others have been easy. For whatever was without, within my own will, was supreme. It has owed no allegiance and never shall. It has moved steadily in liberty with all the responsibility fall, falling thereon. This, I am sure, is the ultimate reasons for my acceptance of anarchism. Um, so, yeah, that, and that gets us into our next section. Um, you can scroll down to the making of an anarchist. Um, and the, really, the convent was a big reason why she got into anarchism. Because if she had never gone to the convent, it's, it's possible she would never have gone into free thinking, which led her to anarchism. She, when she moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, 1860, 1886, um, she started writing for the Progressive Age, um, as well as reciting poems in different um, places. Um, she was very powerful in her circuits, but she didn't, she didn't quite have the ferocity that Emma Goldman or the anarcho-communist Johann Most did. Um, she had more of a cold mentality about it. Uh, she was very calculating when she talked. She was very... Um, very controlled. She didn't tend to yell or anything like that. And she admitted herself in her own writing. She wasn't much of a speaker. She was more of a writer. Um, so it figures that she would be like that. Um, one talk in particular at a Payne Memorial in uh, Lindsville, Pittsburgh, uh, she held a, heard a talk by up-and-coming lawyer Clarence Darrow, which got her interested in socialism. But it was only an interest for a few weeks or so, as, as is typical with uh, youthful people getting interested in politics. Um, it was, um, it, she only was interested in it um, for a few weeks, actually, literally. Like, she told her mother that she had completely become enamored with the, the struggles of the working class against the capitalists and all that stuff. Uh, and she'd return to that much later in her life. But um, she uh, first got interested in anarchism itself because of a debating society in Pittsburgh with a Russian Jew named uh, Morzersky, I don't know much about him, uh, whom she could not seem to answer his questions without falling into deeper and deeper holes um, of logic. So Voltaire finally thought it over and and seemed to latch on to anarchism a little bit more. The second event in Voltaire's life was her discovery of the individual anarchist Benjamin Tucker. Now, I'm sure some of us here at least are familiar with Benjamin Tucker as opposed to Voltaire. Um, Tucker's leading anarchist journey, journal excuse me, at that time was Liberty, and it at once captured uh, Voltaire and her, um, her youthfulness and her energy uh, with politics, uh, and it made her embrace individualist anarchism. Now, she wasn't, she was an individualist anarchist, I mean this is a good clarification to make, she was an individualist anarchist from about the early 1890s to the mid 1890s, maybe late. But after that she did avow, um, or she didn't uh, keep the, as she called it, the economic gospel of Tucker. Um, I don't know whether I agree with that or not, but that's what she said. Um, and she did not call herself an individualist anarchist after that. So it is actually sort of historically incorrect to say she was individualist anarchist, but I'm kind of nitpicking because I like doing that, um, especially with Wolverine. So um, the third event, and possibly the most important, was the, um, was the Haymarket Affair. And I'm sure some of us at least know about that too. Um, this event was really important to Voltaire. This was really the moment that radicalized her. Uh, now at first, she had the typical American reaction to anarchists supposedly bombing the police and stuff like that. She said they ought to be hanged. Uh, and these words basically terrorized her life for uh, as long as she lived. Um, she basically did everything in her power once she had become an anarchist to make up for these words. And she said, quote, for that ignorant, uh, ignorant, outrageous, bloodthirsty statement, I shall never forgive myself. Though I know the dead men would have forgiven me, though I know those who love them forgive me, but my own voice, as it sounded that night, will sound so in my ears till I die a bitter reproach and shame. So she took it pretty harshly. Um, and you can see that kind of religious zeal towards um, statements and really wanting to have a sort of repentance. And it's not a topic I'm going to get into in this talk. Into, uh, this talk, but it's an interesting thing that she kept some of her ideas from the convent even though she rebelled so much against it. The basic facts about the Haymarket Affair, if you don't know, uh, is that it happened on May 3rd, 1886, when the Chicago police decided that they wanted to stop um, a peaceful talk by socialists. It wasn't even an all-anarchist uh, meeting. Um, it was an outside meeting, 
and there were some socialists, some labor leaders, some anarchists, uh, and uh, they wanted to, it was the last speaker, and he was almost done, he was wrapping up, and the police said, um, paraphrasing here, obviously, uh, you know, you have to get off the stage, uh, or whatever it was at the, at the time, podium, and uh, this has become unlawful, or something like that, and he said, no, we've been peaceful this whole time, I'm almost done, it's not a big deal, uh, and, um, and then a bomb was thrown, and to this day, nobody knows who threw the bomb, it's not clear whether it's an anarchist, or non-anarchist or a provocateur or anything. I don't know who it is. Uh, most people agree they don't know who it is. So I'm not going to speculate. Uh, but the people, uh, the, the police then, of course, naturally fired into the crowd, killing, uh, I don't know if the bomb killed anybody. Um, it might have. You would, you would think it would. But um, the, it, the firing into the crowd killed four, injured many more. Uh, eight people were put to trial to determine their guilt. Albert P Parsons, August Spies, George Engel, uh, Adolf Fischer, Louis Ling, Samuel Fielden, Oscar Neves, and Michael Schwab. Uh, of the eight men, only two of them were actually there, and the other two d could have been demonstrably proven to not do it. But as you'll see uh, in this brief description I'm going to give about it, the, the whole thing was a media circus. Uh, the media called it a trial against anarchy. The judge made his own private marks about how he wanted to show those anarchists, um, you know, what for. Uh, and um, he, you know, it, it really shows how, how well the justice system worked even back then. Um, the defendants were largely foreigners, uh, and only a few of the people who were on trial were actually anarchists. Quite a few of the people here um, weren't actually anarchists at all, so it made no sense in that uh, sense as well. Um, so uh, Ling uh, committed suicide uh, via another anarchist who we'll talk about a little bit later, Dyer D. Lum. Um, and on the 11th of November, Parsons, Spies, Engel, and Fisher were hung. Um, pretty sad stuff. To say this made symbols or martyrs out of them is probably understating the case. They became huge heroes, not heroes exactly, but symbols of, of the oppression of the state and um, a really big reason to keep going with, with the movement. Um, you can scroll down. Um, so I, I, won't, I won't get too much into it. Um, I do have a quote from one of her pamphlets on it, but I don't want to get too much into it. Um, so I just want to skip to Dyer D. Lum. Um, I do want to mention, though, the remaining people who were not sent immediately to, uh, to the gallows, um, they were eventually pardoned by the governor, um, and he lost his job for that. So pretty commendable. Uh, and Voltaire actually dedicated a poem to him uh, when he did that and when he died. Um, so she definitely had very... Uh, a real thoughtfulness about her. Um, so the final event that was really instrumental to Voltaire becoming an anarchist was a man named Dyer D. Lum. Now Dyer D. Lum isn't too well known. We actually, um, all one has a uh, bunch of pamphlets and we do actually have one of Dyer D. Lum's uh, writings on uh, trade unions or labor unions. Um, but not much is talked about him at least. I, I wish more people would talk about him. He seems really interesting. I haven't delved into him myself, so I can't talk too much about him, but I do know some basic stuff from Average's biography on Voltaire. Um, that was one of the great things about um, Average's biography. It not only told you about Voltaire, but it told you about a lot of side things like um, Dyer du Lum, and it could get you interested in him as well. Um, she called him, quote, the brightest scholar, the profoundest thinker of the American revolutionary movement, and regarding meeting him as, quote, one of the best fortunes of my life. Um, so she thought very, very highly of him. Unfortunately, he died only five years after they first met. Um, their relation with, relationship was very multi-leveled. They were friends, they were also comrades, and they were also lovers. Uh, now, I'm not going to get too much into Voltaire's lovers, um, because it's, it, she, she had a pretty bad run with uh, who she fell in love with, and uh, it's not a happy story, uh, and it's not too important either, so um, I won't include it unless people want to know about it. Uh, but regardless of how they interacted, um, they did in fact have a love between each other, they wrote poems to each other, they sent letters to each other and stuff like that. Um, so Lum's ideas of anarchism were pretty influential on her, uh, on her because they were pretty eclectic, as Average said, um, but it led to some pretty big backlash from some of the anarchists. Tucker said that he despised him. Uh, Victor Yaros, who was an anarchist at the time, he later uh, disavowed anarchism, uh, called his economic views uh, n neither fish nor flesh. So being eclectic has its uh, drawbacks. Uh, you, you can get, instead of mediating, you can actually get fire from both sides and it kind of sandwiches you in. It's, it's not a, it's a double-edged sword. Um, 
but uh, Lum's effects were most felt through his, uh, his guidance, um, his guidance, his mentoring, and the sense of stability that he gave her, uh, which is particularly felt after, her, after his death. She dedicated a few essays to him um, and um, wrote a poem shortly before he died because his mental issues were becoming more and more apparent. I won't get too into those, but he were, was suffering from several um, illnesses that were taking away his health and stuff like that. Um, so he died shortly after April 6th, 1893. Not too long, uh, only five years really after they had met. Um, so th this would be the first sign of uh, really kind of um, depressing life for Voltaire. She did not live an entirely happy life, uh, I'm sorry to say. And her early life wasn't that happy either, but I didn't get too into that. One, one of the best quotes about him that I found is this, quote, his genius, his work, and this is about Dyer D. Lum from Voltaire's perspective, his character was one of those rare gems produced in the great mind of suffering and it, uh, flashing backward with all its changing lights, uh, the hopes, the fears, the gaieties, the, the griefs, the dreams, the doubts, the loves, the hates, the sum of that, uh, of that which is buried low down there in the human mind. So she was very poetic in her writing, uh, and that's certainly worth talking about, although I don't really talk about it in this presentation, but her, her writing style was very much prose. Um, if you're familiar with types of poetry, um, a lot of her writing was very artistic, very stylized. I, that's what I really like about her. Some people don't like it. Um, I've read a comment by Jeff Riggenbach who did a um, sort of a, a, a libertarian tradition on her and he wrote that he didn't really like it at all. He thought Thoreau's was a lot better. He thought um, other people's was, was a lot better. I think that's nonsense. but. My personal opinion, he's wrong. Anyway, um, so I uh, want to take a little bit of a break from Average's framework, which is what I've been working within. And I want to talk about her anarchism, her atheism, and her feminism, and kind of give you guys a, a brief kind of summary of her views, so you guys get to know her a little bit better on the social views side. Uh, and I'm mostly taking from Presley and Sartwell's fantastic work, The Exqu Exquisite Rebel. Um, and I also have a little bit of analysis of them, but I'll, I'll mostly shy away from analyzing them because I want to I want to stick pretty descriptive here, not too prescriptive. Um, so this means, uh, in effect, you know, I may have a little bit less impartiality about how I feel about her views and uh, her in general. But for the most part, it's it's still staying within averages framework in the sense that I'm not being too biased about how I feel, besides the fact that she's awesome. Um, so. Yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, you can go down. Um, okay, so uh, as a person, Voltaire, uh, like any person really, was a complex figure. At times she could be incredibly irritable with her comrades and paranoid due to her failing health and troubles in the movement, and we'll get to her failing health a little bit later on. Uh, at other times she was very strong-willed, held a commanding respect in the anarchist movement, and wrote constantly. Yet the opposite side of the spectrum, she would, like any human, fail. She would fall into a deep despair. Um, she would lose hope uh, in her life, in her anarchism, uh, and even at times uh, attempt to commit suicide. She tried to commit suicide twice, uh, not consecutively, but within different years. Um, perhaps what drove Voltaire, however, against all these fears and failing health was her dominant idea. Um, the dominant idea is perhaps one of the most important essays if you're going to read Voltaire and Declare um, because it explains a lot of her personal philosophy, um, it has a little bit of meta-ethics, and it's very proto-existentialist, and I like that myself. Um, I like quite a bit of existentialist philosophy, so it really appeals to me. Um, and it, the dominant idea, which is anarchism to her, really kept her going throughout life. Um, and uh, Sharon Presley notes that in The Exquisite Rebel. She wisely notes that the essay seems to hold pretty proto-existentialist um, views. It talks about finding meaning through suffering, um, you know, the problem of existence, um, a historical sort of side of existence, um, and so on and so on and so forth. So the main theme of this essay is that a single idea has dominated all the ages uh, throughout man's existence and has always done so. Uh, she, however, does not think this not, cannot change. She says, quote, But the dominant idea of the age and land does not necessarily mean the dominant idea of any single life. I doubt not that in those long gone days, far away by the banks of the still Nile, in the abiding shadow of the pyramids, under the burdens of other men's st stolidity, they went to and fro restless, active rebel souls who hated all that, a that the ancient society stood for and with burning hearts sought to overthrow it. So there's a clear bridge between her, how she feels and how those people feel uh, and how anarchists feel in general. Um, 
So she definitely feels like she's living in that ancient society. Nevertheless, how do these concepts play into Voltaire the person? Well, the, the will. The will is very powerful with, with Voltaire. Um, and a lot of people have commented about her, um, her will and her drive to live. Because even though she lived a very short life, she died when she was 45, which was still pretty young even then. Um, she, to live as poor as she did, in such frail health, constantly writing, constantly going about. The only reason she didn't do national circuit tours like, um, like Emma Goldman did is because of her frail health and her constitution, basically. She just couldn't handle it. She could barely handle going out of Philadelphia at times. Um, and to be in such a troubling times and to be in such a prosecuted movement, it, it really has to take a strong will to, to survive all that and to live for you know, most of your life being in such a situation. So this idea was prominent in the dominant idea, which Sharon Presley calls um, her essay surely one of her best, I, and I agree. It's definitely one of her best essays, and it's definitely uh, the most insightful if you really want to know what kept Voltaire literally alive at, at some times, at some points. Um, so the, the second part is that it gave her the strength to, to bear the best and worst of people. Uh, despite her intermittent fail failings of health and her near constant poverty, Voltaire basically lived in and out of poverty her whole life. She was never wealthy in the least. Uh, she did a taxing regimen on herself. She constantly wrote. She constantly went to speeches. She constantly went to meetings. She set up organizations. She never stopped. Uh, even, even when she was... Uh, in a very poor state, she almost never stopped it. It took quite a lot for her to stop dedicating herself to the movement, which is really why it's such a shame she's been so forgotten, because she put so much of her life and energy into the anarchist movement, only to be forgotten because her frail health, her lack of speaking abilities, not speaking abilities, but the way she talked was very much different, like I said before, from Emma Goldman and Johann Most and people like that. She wasn't as fiery or uh, provocative, but people really appreciated the beauty and simplicity in her talks. Um, so she had different qualities, but it, it's just, it's a really a shame. Um, so she clung to it for the majority of her life. Um, I will get into later w what happens when she loses it. Um, but that's later on. Um, so let's get into our uh, essays that talk about anarchism itself. And I know this will be of interest to a lot of people here. And I really did want to focus on her politics because I know a lot of people might be more interested in her political views than in her life. You know, I, I, maybe you want to know about what her idea of the state is instead of what she had for breakfast, you know, on a Tuesday morning. Uh, to give a little hyper hyperbolic example. So to begin, I want to start off with America, uh, Anarchism in American Tradition. It's, it's one of her more well-known pieces if any of her pieces are well known among the anarchists. Uh, it's laid out as a natural, anarchism in this essay is laid out as a natural outgrowth of radical republicanism. Uh, some virtues of Protestantism, um, writers who were in time, at that time, in favor of self-government and so on. She basically reasserted the idea that Benjamin Tucker had done 20 years ago that uh, anarchists are basically unterrified Jeffersonian Democrats. And I really like that quote um, by Tucker. Um, so I'm glad she did this essay. So re re she reasserted that through um, people like Jefferson and Locke who believed in political equality. Um, I'm in favor of equality in so far as political equality is concerned. It's another whole topic, but I, I like that she talks about equality of political authority because that's something I'm interested in too. Um, she thought they didn't take it far enough, but she did like the core ideas, and I do too. Uh, and this really shows that she not only took her anarchism from European influences such as Kropotkin, Tolstoy, Bakunin, Goldman, etc., etc., but also from American ones too, like Thoreau um, and the other transcendentalists. Um, so meanwhile, in her essay, Anarchism, uh, Volterine discusses the four types of anarchism as she sees it. Uh, anarchist communism, individualism, and anarchist mutualism. Uh, I think anarchist mutualism is a little bit redundant, but whatever. She, she gives what she calls a uh, skeleton of all these philosophies and quickly points out what she likes about them, what she doesn't like about them. Um, so for vices, with anarcho-communism, it's the idea that things need to be so pre-planned, at least in her mind, um, and so ordered out that it makes her nervous. And so she can't accept anarchist communism because she thinks it'll be just too planned, it's, a central authority is just inevitable, perhaps, anyway. She doesn't say that it's a definite, but she says it just seems like that's what would naturally happen. Um, for uh, the individualist, it's the egoist who really gets her scared of individualism. She thinks the egoist, as Dara D. Lum said, doesn't give a rap about society. Um, and uh, that, that makes her not want to be an individualist. She thinks some individualists, like Tucker, take it too far. 
Tucker was also very sectarian, and he made quite a few uh, abrasive comments against her as well. So she didn't really appreciate that either, which I'm sure influenced her to um, not become an individualist. Um, and she did not like the anarcho-socialist, or she did, for the cons of the anarcho-socialist, along with the communists and some degrees of the mutualist. She thought their conception of the state was too naive or too thin. She thought they'd only see the landed and the property-holding classes as the users of government. But Voltaire wisely points out, no, religious figures have done this too. You don't have to necessarily have a bunch of property to take control of the government, although it is usually a prerequisite. <laughs> um, and um, so it made her too, made it too uh, narrow for her likings. You can scroll down. Um, and then Voltaire concludes by uh, telling her, telling us what her view is. And her view is pretty interesting. Um, you may or may not like it. Uh, she says, quote, for myself, I believe that all these and many more could be advantageously tried in different localities. This is where her anarchism without adjectives comes in, but I'll talk about that a little bit. I would see the instincts and habits of the people express themselves in a free choice in every community, and I'm sure that the distinct environments would call out distinct adaptations. Now, personally, while I recognize that liberty would be greatly extended under any of these economies, I frankly confess that none of these satisfies me. Uh, socialism and communism, as I've already said this, but it, it, deg it uh, demands a j degree of joint effort and administration, which would beget more regulation that is wholly consistent with the ideal anarchism. Individual individualism and mutualism resting upon property involves the development of the private policeman, not at all compatible with my notions of freedom. That's a little bit controversial, but I'll leave it alone. My ideal would be a condition in which all natural resources would be forever free to all, and the worker individually able to produce for themselves for all his vital needs, if he so choose, so that he need not govern his workings or not working by the times and reasons of his fellows. I think that time may come, but it will only be through the development of the modes of production and the tastes of people. Meanwhile, we all cry with one voice for the freedom to try. Now, I love that part. Um, all anarchists are doing, in essence, is saying, hey, let us try what, we're trying to, what we want to do with our own lives instead of controlling it. So she definitely wanted to see a very ecumenical anarchist society, very pluralistic, not blind to the point where she would turn a blind eye if the communists were too centrally planned or uh, private property became too absolutist or whatever. But she definitely wanted people to have, um, I don't want to say have their cake and eat it too, but she definitely wanted people to have their ideals as long as they matched up with a lot of her values too. Um, now, whether Voltaire was right about any of that stuff, I don't want to get into. Maybe Q and A, but I don't want to talk about whether I think any of that's right. I think some of it's right, uh, some of it's not. Um, but it it's, it's, uh, definitely makes it a lot easier to see where she's coming from and why she thought the way she did. Now, this essay is probably the most famous for, <clears throat> in my opinion, is having the best. Well, one of my favorite quotes of all time, really. I mean, I love this quote, and I'm probably going to kill my voice after I read it because it's just so damn long. But um, it's such a great quote, and I really want to read it uh, at length. Uh, I want to read the whole thing. Uh, and it's very poetic, very, very poetic. Uh, but it's, it's basically just talking about what anarchism means to her and what it may mean to you. But the depth she goes into to explain this, some may say is a little bit overdone. I think it's awesome. She says, quote, in her uh, essay, Anarchism, you can find it on, online. She says, ah, once to stand unflinchingly on the brink of that dark gulf of passions and desires, once at last to send a bolt, st uh, straight driven gaze down into the volcanic. Me, once, and in that once, and in that once forever, to throw off the command to cover and flee from the knowledge of that abyss. Nay, to dare it, to hiss and seethe if it will, and make us writhe and shiver with its force. Once and forever to realize that one is not a bundle of well-regulated little reasons bound up in the front room of the brain to be sermonized and held in order with a copybook maxims or moved and stopped by a syllogism, but a bottomless, bottomless depth, depth of all strange sensations, a rocking sea of feeling, wherever uh, sweep strong storms of unaccountable hate and rage, invisible contortions of disappointment, low ebbs of meanness, quakings and shudderings of love that drive us to madness and will not be controlled, hungerings and moanings, and sobbing that smite upon the inner ear, now first bent to listen, as if all the sadness of the sea and the wailings of the great pine forests of the north had met to weep together there in that audible silence to you alone. To look down into that, to know the blackness, the midnight, the, the dead ages in oneself, to feel the jungle and the beast within, and the swamp and the slime, to look down into that, um, and to see, to know, to feel to the uttermost, and then to look at one's fellow sitting across from one in the streetcar, so decorous, so well got up, so nicely com uh, combed, 
and brushed and oiled, and to wonder what lies beyond that commonplace exterior. To picture the cavern in him, which perhaps, um, while he wears that placid iron shirt front, uh, front, front countenance, to conceive how he too shudders at himself, and rises and flees from that love of his heart, and aches in his prison house, not daring to see himself, to draw back respectively from the self-gate of the plainest, most uncompromising creature, even the most debased criminal. Because one knows the non-entity and the criminal in oneself, to spare all condemnation, how much more trial and sentence. Because one knows the stuff of which man is made and recoils at nothing, since all is in himself. This is what anarchism means to you, it means that to me. Uh, and then to turn clockward, sky, starward, skyward, and let the dreams rush over one, no longer awed by outside power of any order, recognizing nothing superior to oneself, painting, painting endless pictures, creating unheard symphonies that sing dreams, sounds to you alone, extending symphonies to the dumb brutes as equal brothers, kissing the flowers as one when a child letting oneself go free, go free beyond the bounds of what fear and custom call the possible. This too anarchism may mean to you, if you dare apply it so. And if you someday, if sitting at your workbench, you see a vision of surpassing glory, some picture of that golden time when there shall be no prisons on the earth, nor the hungry, nor, the, nor houselessness, nor accusation, nor judgment, and hearts open as printed leaves and candid as fearlessness, if you then look across at your low-browed neighbor who sweats and smells and curses at his toil, remember that you do not know his death, nor do you know his height. He too might dream if, if the yoke of custom and law and dogma were broken from him. Even now, you, uh, even now, even know now what uh, blind-bound, uh, motionless chrysalis is working there to prepare its winged thing. Anarchism means freedom to the soul as it does to the body in every aspiration, every growth. Well, that is a huge quote, uh, but it is, it is one of her best. And it's definitely, as you could see, a lot of prose, a lot of description, a lot of poetry. Um, so uh, you can scroll down more. Um, so I want to talk about her feminism now. I didn't talk about this in any particular way. Um, I didn't. I only talked about her anarchism first because that's what might concern people the most or interest them the most. Um, but I want to talk about her feminism next. Um, again, no particular order after anarchism. Um, you can scroll down a little bit because I'm not starting there. Okay, there we go. So in the second uh, part of my presentation, I would like to focus on three essays. Um, Those Who Marry Do Ill, Sex Slavery, and a lesser known, less sizable article entitled The Political Equality of Women. Now, these three essays are particularly notable in each of their own respectable individual ways. As we briefly explore these three essays, and it's pretty brief, um, it is my intention to make it clear why that is. Now, we start, however, with those who marry too ill. Uh, it, she not only disapproves of the current relations between men and women as a feminist, but of marriage itself. And um, she says, uh, she, she defines... She says early on that unless we agree with this upcoming sentence or quote, the society that promotes the free individual is the discernible goal of our present social striving. There is no hope that we shall agree in the rest of this argument. So she makes it clear that unless you're an anarchist, you're probably going to have trouble agreeing with the rest of her. Um, but that's how Voltaire basically judges ill and well in this essay. She talks about uh, whether it harmed or made gains towards the free individual and the pursuit thereof. Now it's based on this judgment that um, Voltaire is determining that those who marry do ill. Um, so it is then vitally important for the sake of the essay and of necessary relevant information to quote Voltaire's explanation at length about what she means when she says the word marriage, because marriage means a lot of things to a lot of different people, as with most words. So she says, quote, but it is neither a religious nor a civil ceremony that I refer to now when I say, quote, those who marry do ill. The ceremony is only a form, a ghost, a meatless shell. I mean the real thing, a permanent relation between a man and a woman, sexual and economical, whereby the present home and family life is maintained. It is of no importance to me whether this is polygamous, polyandric, or monogamous marriage, nor whether it was blessed by a priest, permitted by a magistrate, contracted publicly or privately, or not contracted at all. It is the permanent dependent relationship which I affirm is detrimental to the fundamental growth of individual character, and to which I am unequivocally opposed. Now my opponents know where to find me. So um, that is her stance on marriage. Um, she is basically against any, any dependent sort of relationship, uh, any sort of relationship that would extend indefinitely, because she thinks individuals should be free to uh, make their own relations without worrying about the institution of marriage. And at that time, the institution of marriage was very barbaric, especially uh, compared to now. Um, men could easily uh, rape their wives or beat them or um, any of that stuff. And the courts would be completely on the men's side. Um, it would, they would also... Um, 
they could take their children away, uh, the men could take the, the, the wives' children away, um, they could seize property. Women were very much a slave uh, in, in as far as marriage was concerned then. Now obviously it's not as brutal as it is now. Um, I do have my own stances on marriage. I, I pretty much agree with her that marriage is a failed institution, but uh, even today. Um, so I think that, that that's basically how Voltaire makes it clear that how marriage is done is irrelevant. Marriage is the thing itself that she opposes. Um, and she does not say, you know, she doesn't rely on the divorce rates. She does bring them up, but she doesn't rely on them to make her argument. You know, because that only proves that individuals don't make smart choices with each other. It doesn't necessarily choose that, um, it doesn't necessarily follow that uh, the institution on which they're acting is actively making that possible, if that makes any sense. Um, so she tries to go against um, the arguments, against her argument, but I won't get into them too much time. Again, I don't have enough, enough time. But you should read this essay. It's an excellent, excellent essay. Um, it's you know, definitely a really good feminist critique of marriage. And I think a lot of it still applies today. Not quite as much, obviously. It's gotten a lot better. But I do uh, think a concern for the institution of marriage itself, instead of worrying about people being equal uh, under the law, maybe we should be equal with the law. Um, so she, uh, her positions on marriage are made a little bit, are even more radicalized on her equally radically titled Sex Slavery, um, her essay, Sex Slavery. Now, um, some of the flaws of the institutions of marriage still remain, but, and for example, the divorce rates have not gotten any lower, um, but again, that might not be a good reason to oppose it. Um, but the chains in bonds of marriage were just the beginning of her critique. In the essay, Sex Slavery, um, she talks about how the relation between men and women uh, have basically been um, turned into this sort of slave and master relation between the woman and man. Um, and the occasion of that writing was a comrade named Moses Harmon, a lesser known anarchist, that published several radical essays in his own journal about feminism and the slavery that makes up modern relations between men and women in his opinion, both in marriage and out of it. Uh, but upon publishing this, he was sent to prison for five years hard labor at the age of 70. Um, so I don't know how much hard labor they got out of him, but um, yeah, pretty extreme. Uh, I think, I forget what charge they gave. I wish I had put the charge that they gave him because that's pretty important. But I could totally look it up and get back to anybody who want, who's um, wondering about what charge they could possibly level against him. But that just goes to show you the state doesn't like you talking about institutions they really like, like marriage, keeping the bonds between men and women. So um, one of Voltaire's main points about the essay, however, is to bring across the question that a woman should ask herself, and I'm going to quote her. She says, quote, let a woman ask herself, why am I the slave of man? It, why is my brain said not to be the equal of his brain? Why is my work not equally paid to his? Why must my body be controlled by my husband? Why may he not take my labor in the house, household, giving me in exchange for what he deems fit? Why may he take away my children from me? Will them away yet unborn? Let every woman ask. This is a really important question for women of that age to ask. Why are men so at, have so much privilege compared to the women? Um, the main causes of this kind of slavery for her were the church, the state, and uh, all this sort of uh, domination of the mind and body. Um, so I just want to move on to the next uh, essay. Uh, Sex Slavery is another great essay that you should really read by her. So she has a kind of a sharp response to people who say, well, why don't the wives just leave the relationship? So she says, quote, why don't you run when your feet are chained together? Why don't you cry out when a gag is on your lips? Why don't you raise some hands above your head or raise your hands above your head when they're pinned to your uh, sides? Why don't you spend thousands of dollars when you haven't got a cent in your pocket? Will you tell me where they should go and what they shall do when the state, the legislators, has given to itself the politicians the utter and absolute control of the opportunity to live? When through this precious monopoly, already the market of labor is so overstocked that women and work women are cutting at each other's throats for the dear privilege of serving their lords. So she didn't think very highly of bosses even then. Um, and rightfully so, I believe. But um, So she thinks you know, the state is an agent of oppression because it grants privileges to cause such lords to exist, such as bosses, and the sort of privilege uh, that men have um, uh, over women. Uh, and some feminists to this day still argue that men still have this. But um, So um, her atheism. Um, I just want to discuss secular education, which is a short little blurb, and I also want to discuss um, the... Uh, economic tendency of free thought. 
um, both great essays. Uh, so the point of secular education is her advocating that quote um, that secular parents should a- instruct their own children to question things um, and to think for themselves. Um, so that's a really you know, it's a huge, you know, it's a big controversial opinion. You know, maybe you shouldn't force your opinions on your child and force them to go to church and force them to, you know, um, do all these religious sort of things and uh, maybe think for themselves instead of going along with everything you want them to be. Uh, maybe not use them as a sort of clay and form them into a sort of mini you. Uh, and some parents still do that to this day. So there, there is a sort of relevance in that. Uh, parents can tend to be very controlling, very authoritarian over their own kids. And it's a, it's a sort of authoritarianism I don't think um, libertarians pay not, uh, enough attention to sometimes. So the other big point is that a lot of the non-secular institutions have gotten less and less popular, and secular institutions, um, or they become more and more popular, excuse me, the non-secular ones have become more and more popular, and the secular ones are being slowly taken over, and um, the free th- thinking movement isn't talking about education, how it should be secular, and how everything should be secular, and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it still has some relevance today. I'm not going to get into the relevance of it, but um, I do have it here if you want to discuss that. Um, so, um, and then I, there I talk about uh, molding, basically parents excessively molding them. Religious people still do that to, you know, some religious people, not all. Uh, just because you're religious doesn't mean you're bad about being religious, but uh, some, some of them still do it. Um, and the second base thing is that a lot of these churches have uh, state-based privileges to exist. Now, although religion itself as an idea isn't necessarily a state-based institution or whatever, uh, even today, a lot of, although people may not think about it like this, a lot of churches do exist on the basis of uh, tax privileges, um, land grants, um, political favoritism, um, you know, there's supposed to be a division between church and state and and Voltaren very much um, supported this but even to this day even in America where we're supposed to be you know land of the free and all that um, it's very clear that it's not that case with all those things going on it's very clear that this isn't the case Um, yeah at least that seems to me Uh, you can scroll down Um, but I want to turn my attention to our second essay The Economic Tendency of Free Thought and this is actually a perfect essay to end on um, because it, it really articulates a point I, I would have made if I had remembered to make it, um, that both Rene's ideas all come together. They really infor- reinforce one another. Um, she, her atheism supports her feminism. Her feminism supports the atheism. The feminism supports the anarchism. But it not, it's not the point that she does this, but she does it really well. Um, a lot, plenty of people do this, but it's, it's one thing to do it, but it's another thing to do it really well. In my opinion, she did it really well, and that's what makes her stand out for me. Um, so she thinks that anarchism is a necessary outgrowth of secularism, uh, deism or agnosticism or uh, especially atheism is really what she's talking about. Um, and I'm inclined to agree myself uh, being an atheist. Um, so Voltaire, she, she makes a great comparison. She says the French Revolution was a sort of overthrow of the government of the mind, uh, the religious institutions. So she says that the French Revolution was sort of an anarchism in the sense that it overthrew the church. Now. The French Revolution didn't go perfectly, obviously, uh, and it certainly didn't go as well as some anarchists would have liked it to. But this is still a pretty brilliant move by Voltaire, because in my opinion, it makes it so crystal clear how anarchism and free thought, uh, which is basically atheism, agnosticism, deism, um, can only can not only coincide, but it's easily provable that they can um, easily be historically matched. So, Voltaire also has a case against God. Um, that's pretty big. I, I think I'll I think I'll talk about that I'll, uh, at least quote her, and then I think I might um, end after like another paragraph or two, and I want to conclude with like you know a few minutes statement, and then I'll open up for a quick like Q and A. Um, due to time constraints. So um, her case against God, she says, quote, Now, the idea of God in the first place is an exceeding contradiction. The sign God, uh, so Dias tell us, was invented to, tell, uh, to express the inexpressible, the, incomprehens- the incomprehensible and infinite. Then they immediately set out about defining it. These definitions go about to be, uh, uh, proved to be about as self-contradictory and generally conflicting as the original absurdity. 
but there is a uh, particular set of attributes that f uh, form a sort of common ground for all these definitions, and they're still around today. Uh, they tell us that God is possessed of supreme wisdom, supreme justice, and supreme power. In all these catalogs of creeds, I've never yet heard one that can not for its nucleus unlimited put, uh, potency. So she's basically saying she's never heard of a case that doesn't say God has to be absolutely awesome or powerful. Um, um, so she says, now let us take deist, the deist upon his own ground and prove to him either that God is limited as to wisdom or limited as to justice um, or limited as to power else there's no such thing as justice. Uh, she says, first, then God being all just wishes to do justice. Being all wise, he knows how to do justice. Being all powerful can do justice. Why then injustice? This is a classic sort of problem of evil um, type argument against God. Um, either God can do justice and won't or doesn't know what justice is or he cannot do it the immediate reply is, uh, in her opinion is quote what appears to be injustice in our eyes and the sight of omniscience might may be justice God's ways are not our ways but she says oh but if he's, all, he's the all wise pattern they should be what is good enough for God ought to be good enough for man but what is too mean for man won't do for a God um uh, else there is no such thing as justice or injustice and every murder, every robbery, every lie every crime in the calendar is right and upon that one premise of supreme authority you upset every fact in existence so she makes a pretty strong case I'm not going to finish the whole thing but um, she basically says believing in a God makes your rights privileges that God can just take them away be happy that you can breathe because the Lord has let you be happy that you have food because the Lord could have taken them away um, so it's, it's more of a be thankful for life not accept your life, live it um, try to have freedom in your life. It's just be happy God let you live. Um, so that's her opinion. You know, I'm not saying it's right or not. Uh, I, think it's a, it's, I think it's a decent case against God. And uh, I would talk about Herman Helcher, but I don't have time. Uh, I would talk about her later life, don't have time, etc., etc. So I want to conclude. Uh, it was a really good point to conclude because her feminism basically tells her that the, uh, the, the non-secular institutions basically oppress the women. They put them into these lower positions where uh, they can only provide for the family while the man does his quote-unquote job in the family. You know, He pays the money and she bakes or whatever. Uh, and you know her anarchism tells her no this authority this rulership over other people isn't right and it should be abolished um, so she was very much against the church um, I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm fairly certain she would uh, respect people's expression of religion but she doesn't so much like the way that it's expressed in modern day society which is a very state infused context so um, a lot of what I've talked about here um, is very, a very varied ecumenical approach to anarchism, and that's basically called anarchism without adjectives. Now, I myself am an anarchism, uh, anarchist without adjectives, uh, basically in the uh, Voltaire Declare sort of way. Um, and I think a lot of the infighting between anarchists is very um, petty, and I think a lot of it can be solved if we actually take time to understand, and I know this is a very general sort of argument, but uh, I think I think we really have to take time to understand each other's positions. And like uh, I had, I, I said at the at the end, like you know, anarcho capitalists should be reading more Bakunin and Kropotkin and stuff like that. And you know, anarcho communists should, you know, heaven forbid, start reading some Rothbard or something like that. And it's a pretty ridiculous thing to say. But the reason why people laugh at that, I think, it actually shows more about the movement than it does actually show about my argument. Like, it shows more about people being so close-minded they can't just read another author and give it a shot. So I think an anarchism without adjectives really has um, a real value to it. And I think an ecumenical approach is a lot better than a, um, a really strict sort of Tuckerite notion of anarchism. Because he, he simply didn't think anarcho-communists were anarchists at all. I think Voltherine would have at least given them the benefit of the doubt. She said, okay, try your thing. But Tucker was more like, no, you, you guys aren't anarchists. Quite simply, you guys are not anarchists. I don't like that approach. I think it's not really helpful towards dialogue, and I don't think it's good strategy. Um, and I don't think if we are going to have a revolution at any point ever, um, that it's going to come from people who are doing theories or spinning theories who do these kind of talks. I don't think it's going to come from that. I think it's going to call, come from common kind of people, people who led the Mexican Revolution that she really liked. Um, I think it's going to come from the bottom up. And I don't think walking up to people on the sidewalk and saying, hey, did you know about Rothbard's theory of credit in the 1930s? i got to tell you, it's swell. I, I don't think that's going to lead to a revolution. And I don't think that's what we really need. I think we really need simple, sincere um, things to say to common people 
who you know don't all get out the economic jargon. I don't even get a lot of the economic jargon myself. Um, I think that's what we really need. I think it needs to come from the bottom up, and I think it really needs to come from the common people. Uh, and that's a lot of what Voltaire believes in her later days. So can't talk about it anymore. Wish I could, but my voice is dying, and um, the presentation, you know, got more than halfway through. So thank you very much. If we can do Q and A for at least five minutes, that'd be great. But thank you. If you could sum her up in as few words as possible, how would you describe her? Can't sum her up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <sighs> Someone who has never heard of her. Okay, well, I would tell this in the fewest words, yeah, I know, right? I could write a book about her. I basically just did. Um, well, so Voltaire and Declare was um, an anarchist, a feminist, and a free thinker. Those are the basics about her. She did not believe in government. She did not believe in the church. She did not believe in marriage. And she didn't believe in a lot of the gender relations of the day. Um, she had a very ecumenical approach to anarchism. And I think her types of seeing the world is much needed today, especially in light of a lot of the anarchist bickering. So that's what I could think of off the top of my head. I, I can't give a very short, because I did all this, and then people say, well, just sum up all those, that, that, that the 30 page uh, presentation, can you sum that up for me? No, I can't. Um, I can try, I certainly can try, and I, and I don't mean to disappoint people, but uh, it, it's hard to sum up you know, our life when you get so interested in it. Because um, you realize there are so many complexities about it. So anyway, I know I'm still going on about it. Whatever. So um, in reading about Wolverine and the folks surrounding her, I mean, do you re do you feel that the distinction between social anarchism and individualist anarchism is often exaggerated? And, and what do you think that um, adherents on either side can learn from reading the literature of the other? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so, Voltaire throughout her life did a lot of alliances with a lot of different people. She um, allied with people like Emma Goldman to Tucker to, you know, she, despite her and Tucker's differences, she read, she wrote a lot in Liberty, and he actually published um, The Economic uh, Tendency of Free Thought and uh, quite a few of other, her other essays, but so did Emma Goldman. Um, I do think sometimes, and Roderick Long, a uh, noted, like, uh, left libertarian, he's a professor, uh, at Auburn University, he, he's noted that he thinks a lot of the differences between individualists and socialists is kind of um, overemphasized or overly put. And, I, and I, I sort of like the way he tries to be a mediator. Sometimes he likes to say, well, sure, you know, the anarcho-capitalists or individualists or whatever you want to call them have a point, and the anarcho-socialists have a point too. Um, and instead of just attacking one another, let's try to see what each point brings to the table. Now, for instance, he has a, an article about Voltaire called Voltaire Declare, an anarcho-capitalist, and um, he talks about anarcho-socialists who would say, well, no, she, she was against bosses and she was against wage relations, and that's debatable to begin with, but... Um, and anarcho-capitalists would say, well, in, in ca capitalistic anarchism, it's part of the market anarchy series. We actually have it for sale, if you're interested. Um, it's a dialogue between her and Rosa Sublodinsky. I think that's how you pronounce it. And it's called The Individualist and the Communist. And she says, sure, capitalist anarchism, whatever you want to call it. Um, and anarcho-capitalists will jump on this and say, see, see, she's an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, and so he says, well, that's not exactly fair, but neither is the anarcho-socialist argument. So... I think I kind of agree. There needs to be more mediation between sides. Um, and like with Alt Expo X, to bring it back to the event itself and not me or Voltarine, um, we're trying to ally more with social anarchists too because I think they bring a lot to the table. I think they got a lot of good insights, especially about reinforcing sort of a multi-layered sort of approach to um, oppression in society. They don't think ju it's just statism, but they think a lot of cultural norms are important too. I, I kind of share that uh, opinion. So I think that's, what, uh, that's a big part of social anarchism I really like, that they have a multi-layered sort of approach to criticizing society as it stands. And sometimes I think anarcho-capitalists tend to be a little thin, but... Um, so, yeah, I, I do think that the, the differences are overstated. And I'm not, I don't have like a, a handbook for you to tell you how to resolve them. I wish I did. Uh, it gets so ridiculous sometimes. Um, especially on some Facebook, Facebook groups I won't mention. <laughs> um, so, yeah, any, any more questions? I'm happy to answer them. If not, then thank you. Okay, awesome, thanks.